some information about daytime tourism. Now I'm going to share some information about nighttime activities. All right. So, which I, for obvious reasons, I didn't give you yesterday. So, there are two things that I strongly advise you to do. Okay. Now, I am in no way trying to encourage any sort of behavior, but I understood when I came to this country that the microphysics of interpersonal relation is different than any other country that I know of. So ask information to your Brazilian friends on how to interact with other people in any place you might hang out in the evening. Both sort of activities are, the, the neighborhood is Villa Madalena, okay? I probably don't need to write it down. That's uh, where the fun happens usually. There's other places too, but that's what I know best. And for the for all, I, the only place I personally know is Sunday evening uh, after 6 p.m. in a place called Canto Daema. Okay, the metro station should be Faria Lima. For what concerns samba and in general live music, I would recommend two places that are open both on Friday and Saturday. I mean, wherever you go to Villa Madalena and start walking around, you're going to find it. These are my favorite ones. And uh, so there is a street which is called Rua Horacio Lane. And, okay, this actually stands here. There's the main avenue and a lot of streets here. And here is a little bit more complicated. But here and here, actually here, this place is called Tamarineira. And I would say around 21 niche and on this place is called o do borogodo this place is super famous and actually when i came for the first time to brazil they took me here during my interview for the job which is one of the reasons why i'm here and i later learned that the owners of this piece of land they decided not to sell in spite of an amazingly high commercial offer, not to sell to build a huge building because their father would have not wanted to. So I think they also owe some respect. And this is a place that goes on after 22, 30, 23. If you go before this time, there's going to be nothing. But this is going until around something like 3 a.m., 4 and this is literally 200 meters, okay? The most convenient metro station for both of these is Fragique Coutinho. But you can also reach it from the metro station of Villa Maddalena. If you Google map both of them, it's very easy, okay? I'm sure you're going to find this. All right? Now I'm going to raise it because I didn't give you any of this information. This structure over here, you're going to identify it. It's a graveyard. And in my recollection of the fact that many music places are in front of the graveyard is that because the neighbors don't complain. Oh. 
Okay. Non mi dai qualche minuto in più, no? Mi dai qualche minuto in più. Okay. Did you write it down? So Okay, so <clears throat> welcome to this uh, last lecture of this course. What? Thank you. I was hoping you would forget but <laughs> So welcome to this uh, uh, last lecture of this course. Uh, let's start with uh, summarizing a little bit just the main points that we got yesterday. Okay. So let's uh, redo the famous plot here so that we have all the information necessary to proceed, and we keep the same formalism as uh, yesterday. So we have the shock front here at z equals zero. The upstream is at minus infinity. The downstream is in the positive side. And uh, what we said is that the velocity in the plasma, in the shock frame, the velocity of the medium in the upstream side is u1, the downstream one is u2. And uh, we also obtained uh, several conclusions that, well, first of all, u1 over u2 is equal to rho2 over rho1, and that's what we call the compression factor. If you throw a particle in here and you allow the particle to go back and forth, through diffusion, you have a spectrum of accelerated particles, which uh, is FOP proportional to P to minus 3R over R minus 1 if FOP is in the phase space. So the number of particles is 4 pi, P, uh, 4 pi P square FOP. Three, uh, all these results are at first order independent of the diffusion coefficient, which is the microphysics of the problem. So that's good news in a sense. Uh, for, we said that uh, um, the uh, diffusion coefficient enters in estimating the so-called acceleration time, which we estimated to be of the order of DOP over U1 squared. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but if you are interested in the order of magnitude, then, then uh, this is a good, um, uh, a good summary. But also, we started looking at the things that we didn't like of this theory, right? So the first thing is that we assumed uh, stationarity, but uh, I also tried to convince you that if you assume stationarity, this implies that there cannot be a P max. But think about it, why? I mean, stationary means that nothing can change explicitly in time, right? So assume that you have particles which have certain P max reached at a given time, and that these particles diffuse in the downstream. We said that the return probability from downstream is 1 minus 4 U2 over U1, uh, over C, right? That means that there is a finite chance that these particles of order of energy P max must go back to the shock, therefore their energy must be larger, right? Therefore, only P max equal infinity can possibly be uh, uh, consistent uh, with uh, the assumption of stationarity. But also, I told you that the total energy in the form of cosmic rays, namely the integral in the P uh, between 
uh, Pmax, between some P injection and Pmax of, F of P times the energy, uh, the kinetic energy of the particles with momentum P, since this guy scales like P to minus four, right? And T of P in the relativistic regime goes like P, this object here is proportional to the logarithm of P max over uh, P injection over P min. Actually, it's, uh, you can show that this is of order MC, and this, because of stationarity leading to P max infinity, needs to be infinite too. So that means that you are starting with the assumption that the system is test particle, so you're only throwing particles in the system one at a time, and these particles cannot possibly affect anything about the system itself, but you're finding as a conclusion that in fact the energy density of these particles can be l l large. Well, even if it is not infinite, I also told you yesterday that the total energy that you have possibly available in this system is rho u squared. That's, that's your budget. All what you accelerate must be extracted from rho u squared. So the problem is not only that this may, be <clears throat> may become infinite, but rather that epsilon cosmic rays might, might become comparable with rho u one squared. And even when that happens, of course, you are violating the initial assumption of test particles, right? Because you are uh, transforming a big part of the uh, kinetic budget of your system, or energy budget of your system into accelerator particles. So it cannot possibly be test particles anymore, right? Can you see what I'm writing? It's a little too small, maybe, I don't know. But you're young, you can see. So anyway, epsilon cosmic rays rho u on squared. Um, so I want to, oh, and eight, using this, tau acceleration DOP over u1 squared, I also told you that, uh, I think Pasquale will discuss this today, the diffusion coefficient <coughs> that you get from cosmic ray transport in a galaxy is of order 10 to 28, 10 to 29 centimeters square uh, per second times some energy dependence, right? But you can use, so, so now imagine again, to be in the reference frame of a shock front associated with a supernova, okay? The supernova explodes and you are sitting right on the shock front and you see the shock propagating into the interstellar medium. So the zero order assumption that you might make is that in the place in which you are expanding, since there was no shock before, you are just gonna find the standard conditions of the interstellar medium. So whatever Pasquale will tell you later. But if you use this assumption, then uh, the maximum energy that you get by comparing this acceleration time with a typical age of a few hundred or even a thousand years for the supernova is um, E max of order GV, therefore to low to be useful, okay? So these uh, last points, the five, six, seven, and eight, sort of force you to think a little bit uh, outside the box. So you want to find some, at least general uh, uh, directions in which to move to generalize this theory. And of course, you're gonna go nonlinear. So of course, we cannot do here all nonlinear theory, but we can understand the physics of it pretty well. So let's try to do that. Okay, so let's start from these points here, the five, six, and seven. So you remember that at some point we found the, uh, this is the z-axis, we found that d and dz, uh, the, from the conservation equations, we found that in the form, in the differential form, is rho u squared uh, plus pressure equal zero, right? And also, of course, conservation of mass. So again, in the stationary regime, uh, rho u equal zero, right? Okay, so I tried to convince you that the energy density in the cosmic rays can become comparable with rho u squared. But even if it doesn't, in a generic way, when you want to generalize this expression to include the effect of cosmic rays, you need to account for the additional contribution of the pressure of the accelerated particles, 
that's a generic conclusion. Uh, in the worst case, or in the best case, that term is going to be negligible. But it's there. That means that, in general, here, you also have, let's call it PCR, which is the pressure in the form of accelerated particles. Now, you remember that these two, together with the third equation, which is uh, adiabaticity, led to the so-called rankine ugonio relations, right? The jump conditions. And from there, we derived the compression factor and so on. Now, in your opinion, what would uh, happen if I now adopt these two instead of the original two um, at the shock? Is there something that changes? In other words, the cosmic ray pressure, is it going to affect the jump conditions at the shock? Remember, I told you many times, the particle distribution F of P is distinct from the thermal distribution. The thermal distribution is the one that leads to uh, the jump conditions. So the gas is slowed down, heated up. F, by definition of accelerated particles, is continuous across the shock. Therefore, also the pressure of the accelerated particles is continuous across the shock. If you plot the pressure of the accelerated particles, it just doesn't feel at all the shock. Therefore, on the jump conditions at the shock itself, the pressure of the accelerated particles is not going to have any effect. But it's going to cause a mess somewhere else. Let's see why. Instead of applying these, uh, th are you following me? Now, instead of applying those equations, as we have always done so far, at the shock surface, let's apply it to what um, happens before the shock. So here. From here to here. OK? And let's see what happens. So let's call one this point here, so immediately, so one for me is uh, zero minus, and uh, two is uh, zero plus, okay? And uh, also let's call with the index zero upstream infinity, okay? So I'll, I'll use the index zero to indicate what happens at upstream infinity. Remember, I told you that in the standard situation, everything upstream and everything downstream is constant. The only interesting thing is, thing is, in, is happening at the shock itself, right? Now the situation is going to change dramatically. So let's write these equations from, uh, road, so from zero. So in zero, you have road zero, you zero squared, plus the pressure of the gas in zero, plus the pressure of cosmic rays in zero. And this must be equal to the same quantity evaluated at one, which is rho one u one squared plus the pressure of the gas in one plus p uh, cosmic rays one. What is p cosmic rays zero? Huh? So compared with the pressure of cosmic rays close to the shock is zero. So let's say that P cosmic rays zero is zero. So there are no cosmic rays at upstream infinity. Hmm? Now let's divide all these terms by this guy here. What is this guy? Well, it's the total energy that you can possibly use, right? Rho zero u zero squared is the kinetic energy that the uh, energy density that the plasma has in going into the shock. So div let's divide by that. So this becomes P gas zero over rho zero u zero squared uh, uh, plus one equal to rho one u one squared over rho zero u zero squared plus P gas one divided by 
rho zero u zero squared uh, plus p cosmic rays one over rho zero u zero squared. Okay. Now you remember that uh, the sound speed was defined as gamma p over rho, right? So in fact, this object here is one over gamma Mach number zero squared, right? Gamma, I mean the adiabatic index, plus one equal. For this term here, you can use the mass conservation. Mass conservation is telling you that rho zero u zero is equal to rho one u one. Therefore, this guy is simply u one over u zero. No? Now, this one, let's keep it like that for a second. And what is P cosmic rays one over rho zero is zero squared? Well, suppression so of cosmic rays divided by the total energy. So you can define that as a sort of efficiency of acceleration. If that was one, it means that you are uh, transforming all the energy of the shock into accelerated particles. So this, let's call it psi cosmic rays. Now this term is a little bit more complicated, but it's of the same order of magnitude as this one. It's just that the Mach number is not M0, but it's some M1, but it's still very large. So the point I want to make is that the terms, since we are operating in the assumption that Mach number is large, one over gamma Mach number squared is negligible. So this term here and this term here are actually pretty small, right? And so in the end of the story, u1 over u0 is 1 minus psi cosmic rays. And so look at what we got. That all of a sudden, adding cosmic rays leads us to the conclusion that the plasma is slowing down while it is approaching the shock. What does that mean? Physically, it's obvious, right? Remember that I told you that the diffusion coefficient is typically a growing function of momentum, right? That means that particles with high P can get farther away from the shock. Okay, so imagine to be a fluid element that is approaching the shock from upstream. If you are approaching the shock from upstream, you're going to find first few particles which are the high energy particles, and then gradually you see more and more and more, and when you get to the shock, you see all of them. Right? You see all of the particles. So while doing so, the fluid element feels a pressure that increases up to the maximum, which is the cosmic ray pressure, P cosmic rays 1. So the effect of this pressure is counteracting the plasma that is trying to approach the shock. So the velocity of the plasma that in a standard situation is constant, instead slows down. So uh, in other words, if you had to plot the distribution of velocity as a function of z at a normal shock, it would look something like this, right? But now instead, in a, uh, in a uh, shock in which particles are accelerated effectively, efficiently, it looks something like this, okay? So the gas goes from velocity u0 to some velocity u1 here, and then velocity u2, and so on. What, is, what does this imply, again, physically? As you see, I'm not using a lot of mathematics. It's very simple considerations. Mathematically, it's a little bit more complicated. But you remember I told you yesterday that uh, the spectrum of the particles is basically determined completely by the compression factor at the shock. This remains true even in nonlinear theories of cosmic ray acceleration. The only problem is that, of course, as you can see from here, the diffusion coefficient becomes, I'm sorry, the compression factor becomes a function of momentum. In other words, a particle which is very high P, very high momentum, can probe all this area. Therefore, the compression factor that it feels is this one. 
a particle that has low momentum spends time very close to here, so it can feel this compression factor. So even without doing the whole thing, the whole calculation, you sort of know what to expect in terms of spectrum from this. Again, in terms of spectrum, if I plot here p to the fourth times f for a strong shock, the net result would be something like this, right? p to minus four multiplied by p to the four is a constant. Hmm? But when I add the effect of cosmic rays, you are reducing the compression factor at, at small momenta. What happens when the, when the compression factor is smaller? Spectrum is? Hmm? Steeper, harder, what is it? We said strong shock, P to minus four. What happens when R is smaller than four? It's written there, just read. So the spectrum becomes steeper. So when R is less than four, as it happens here, the spectrum becomes steeper. So at low energy, the spectrum gets steeper. At high energy, the compression factor is larger and the spectrum gets either p to the minus four or even harder than that because of other effects. So the spectrum that we liked as a power law is no longer a perfect power law. In reality, it doesn't get too far from it, but there are applications of this idea in which you need to invoke this effect, otherwise you cannot explain observations, for instance, in the radio uh, for Tycho. Okay, so first implication of points five, six, uh, and uh, seven is that uh, in a nonlinear approach to uh, diffusive shock acceleration, the spectrum is not a perfect power law anymore, but it is concave. Now, there is another obvious conclusion of this, right? I told you in the lecture yesterday, I believe, when we found, no, the day before yesterday, when we did the rankino ganeo relations at the shock, that what a shock does the best is to heat, right? So what the shock is actually doing is to take kinetic energy of the, of the plasma that is going towards it and scrambled and scramble that uh, kinetic energy so that you, it goes from bulk motion into internal motion. So in the end, you are heating, right? So the temperature T2 behind the shock is, of course, an index of how effective the shock is. For a strong shock, T2 is a, a large fraction of the kinetic energy of the particles incoming. Now, what happens if you have an accelerator in these particles? Well, if I'm accelerating the particles, of course, uh, part of the rho u1 squared is not going to go into heating, but into accelerating particles. Therefore, by energy conservation, there is less energy left to heat the plasma. So you expect that at a shock that is effectively accelerating particles, the temperature of the gas behind the shock is lower than it would be if it were not accelerating particles. You following? This is not just a you know, curiosity. Pasquale told you yesterday that, for instance, gases in uh, clusters of galaxies emit radiation X-rays through Bram Stralung. The same thing happens here. You have thermal X-rays from the, behind the shock due to Bram Stralung emission. But the temperature at which you are expecting the thermal emission to occur is depending on how much energy is channeled into cosmic rays. Because if the temperature that you expect is lower, then there is less emission at the end at the lower frequency. Right? Hmm? Now, you might ask, OK, how do I know what temperature do, to expect? Well, there are people that, you know, there are people that spend 30 years looking at stars going around the black hole of the galaxy. There are other people that spend 30 years looking at the shock moving. <laughs> so there are actually situations in which you see the shock front of the supernova moving over decades. 
So you know what the velocity, you know the conditions in the medium, and therefore you know uh, the, you, you know how to estimate the conditions in the, uh, that enter the Rankine Gagnon. So in principle, you can compare what to expect, uh, not in all cases, but in some cases, you know how to compare the uh, temperature that you would expect from Rankine Gagnon with the temperature that you actually observe. Um, there is another way to check this, but uh, maybe we can discuss this during the question time. And it's a very nice uh, piece of um, observation and a nice piece of theory. Okay, so uh, I would say that as a conclusion of this, the, uh, you create this uh, gradient of velocity upstream that gets the name of cosmic ray precursor. This is the first point. As a consequence of point one, you have that cosmic ray spectrum, F of P, is no longer power law. Three, temperature T2 with cosmic rays is less than T2 with no cosmic rays. Okay? So these are the very basic uh, implications of taking into account the pressure of uh, accelerated particles at um, a shock. So you can actually develop a complete theory, nonlinear theory, that takes into account together particle acceleration in the way that we did yesterday with um, the back reaction. So with the equation of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, put all together and gives you a spectrum that doesn't have any problem anymore with this point, uh, with these points here, because it knows how to self-regulate. In other words, what happens is that if you, if the system is trying to push too much energy into the, um, into the particles, this becomes smaller and smaller, the spectrum becomes steeper and steeper, and that's a point. At, at some point, it switches off. So the system sort of uh, finds a self-regulation. So it cannot accelerate too much because it would violate energy conservation. It would, cannot accelerate too little because the system switches off. So it finds some sort of a balance, okay? And this, is, uh, this has been studied in the last 10 to 15 years or so, and there is a lot of literature on this, uh, on this problem. But it's only part of the story because now we have to go to this issue here, which is probably the most pressing, because in the end of the story, we want to compare with observations, at least the ones on uh, galactic cosmic rays. And uh, as I said, maximum energy is way too low. Uh, again, try as an exercise to put the numbers in, just compare d over u squared for uh, take d three times 10 to 28 uh, centimeters squared per second times energy to some power and take this as 10,000 kilometers per second or 5,000 kilometers per second, compare it with 1,000 years, and you will see that the maximum energy you get is low. Okay, so what do I do? Here we have to go back to some, um, uh, some of the stuff that Pasquale Serpico discussed in the first day. Okay? And not repeat it, but try to see if there too, maybe there is some weak point. So I told you yesterday that that's what theorists do. They develop a theory for the purpose of destroying them. So after you develop the theory of cosmic ray diffusion, you try to see the weak points. So let's try to see one weak point. What Pasquale told you is that um, if you have a bunch of uh, perturbations, a particle can scatter resonantly with these perturbations, provided there is power on the res resonant wave number, right? On the k equal one over the Larmor radius mu. Okay, so I propose a Gedanken experiment. Again, an ideal experiment, a thought experiment. Assume you have a gun that is shooting cosmic rays and they are going straight, okay? So you have all these particles that are being shot like this and there are bunch of alpha end waves which are sitting there, okay? Even at the right scale. So what happens? This uh, flow of particles at some point after one 
lambda, path length, start feeling the effect of, the, of scattering. So the particles will start, the beam will start broadening. And if you wait long enough, it will broaden and broaden more until it isotropizes, right? Okay, so there was a momentum of the particles that was going in this direction to start with. And then all of a sudden, there is no momentum going in that direction anymore. So you're not conserving momentum if this were the end of the story, right? So this momentum must have been gone somewhere. Now, what is the only thing that the cosmic rays are interacting with? Huh? I always feel these answers which are way below noise level, <laughs> at least my noise level. <laughs> Good waves. And so the only way that, uh, the only place where this uh, momentum can go is actually into the, the waves themselves. And so the idea can, comes, it's like, well, what if the perturbations are there a little bit and to start with, but then the fact that the particles are diffusing into that background actually make those waves even more, even larger and more effective, no? So let's try to see if this leads us anywhere. So Pasquale derived a distribution function in the form for, for his uh, derivation of the transport equation in the form of some uh, F0 of P no? times 1 plus uh, VD over C delta uh, mu where mu is the pitch angle, and VD, let's call it a drift velocity. And this drift velocity, as you might remember, do you, is what? <laughs> so if the particles were going straight, that would be the, street, the speed of light. But if the particles are diffusing, do you remember what is the current associated with, uh, with the particles? No. <laughs> so the current, you remember the current, is D nabla F, right? With, yeah, the sign, forget the sign here, but it's D nabla F, right? To be precise, it's minus D nabla F. So a current, however, is always some sort of density times some velocity. So that's the drift velocity that I'm referring to. Okay? So this is basically this guy here, which is also a definition of the anisotropy. So this VD over C is the level of anisotropy that you expect in a diffusive regime. So if the particles are diffusing, people say, oh, they isotropize. It's true they almost isotropize, to the level of Vd over C. So when you hear people talking about anisotropy of cosmic rays, what they are referring to is, in fact, that Vd over C. And Vd over C, again, is related one-to-one -one with the gradients in the cosmic ray distribution. That's why if you're sitting close to a source, the gradient is stronger, you expect more anisotropy. Okay? Okay, so, <clears throat> of course, if this term were not there, the total momentum of the particles in a given direction is zero, for obvious reasons, right? But uh, on the other hand, if the momentum, if that term is, is there, then in principle you can uh, integrate 4 pi p square f of p. Never forget this 4 pi p square because otherwise you get uh, the wrong result. Um, 4 pi p square times, um, well, times p if you, sorry, this is the integral in d mu. 4 pi p squared of p times p is the total number of particles in that energy bin, in that momentum bin, sorry, uh, times 1 plus vd over c mu, and then the momentum in the given direction is p mu, okay? So the momentum that the particles carry in diffusive regime, uh, you can uh, just uh, do this very easily, and it's n larger than p times mp v gamma vd 
over C, and there is a two-thirds factor. Let me forget about the two-thirds. It doesn't matter for our considerations. So where this n of p, or larger than p, is the number of particles with momentum larger than the momentum p that you are considering. So this guy here is 4 pi p cube f. I call it, for brevity, n larger than p. OK? And I've used, of course, the definition of p as m v gamma. So. What is uh, uh, the final state of this thought experiment that I propose to you? Well, of course, at some point, the particles will have diffused enough that they almost iso they isotropize. In which frame? So the waves are moving, right? But when the bulk velocity of the cosmic rays, that VD, becomes of the same order of magnitude as the velocity of the waves, then they are basically at rest with each other. So that's when the thing ends, the phenomenon ends. So in a sense, the particle momentum that we are talking about is forced to change from here, from this guy here, to something which is um, roughly the same thing, but instead of Vd, V alpha n, which is the velocity of the, of the waves. So in other words, the changing momentum that the particles experience is n larger than p times mp. Let me assume v and c are the same. So let me assume that this is already relativistic for simplicity. We cancel out some terms. Um, gamma and then vd minus va. So this is the momentum change associated with this phenomenon. And we are assuming that this momentum all goes completely into the waves. OK, so, what are the, so this momentum must be gained by the waves themselves. At which rate? Uh, OK, one step back. So on what time scale does this happen? So now, how long does it take for this to happen? OK. Can I? Uh, Maybe I can erase here, no? Otherwise, I have to go on the other side, and it's causally disconnected from here. Are you following the line of thought? OK. How long does it take to, to uh, have this change in momentum? OK, so you remember that the diffusion coefficient, again, is 1 third of RL times the velocity. We assumed it's C, right? Divided by 1 over the dimensionless power spectrum at the resonant wave number. We derived this. Uh, Pasquale derived this. I used it yesterday already, so it should be fine. And this, delta, this uh, guy here is delta B squared at the resonant wave number divided by the total field, the original field, B0 squared. It's relative power. So it's a number. It's dimensionless. And we also wrote this as one third of uh, C times the path length, right? And this path length, by comparing this with this, you easily derive that the path length must be RL of P divided by F at K resonant, right? So what is the time scale over which the particle deflects by 90 degrees? It's basically lambda of P divided by the speed of the particles. And this one is uh, gamma divided by omega cyclotron, 1 over F. OK? Again, calculated at K resonant. So omega cyclotron is, you remember, no? The omega of gyration is omega cyclotron divided by gamma. And omega cyclotron is EB0 over MC. 
okay? So now I know how much momentum is lost by the particles, and I know on which time scale tau. So I know that delta P over delta T is of the order of that ratio there. So N P, N P V uh, gamma V D minus V A, and divided by delta T. So this is uh, gamma, and then I have, I have omega cyclotron and F of K resonant. This gamma disappears. Okay, now this is the rate of momentum at the, which is transferred to uh, the waves by uh, our assumption, right? Therefore, we have to write the same thing. So this is for the particles, let's call it cosmic rays. And now I have a corresponding delta P over delta T associated with the waves. Well, here we have to go a little bit, use our physical intuition. Well, the, the momentum associated with these, the energy associated with these particles is delta um, B squared over 8 pi, and dimensionally, if you divide by the alpha n speed, you get a momentum, and then I need a time scale. But the time scale is something that I want to calculate. So I want to calculate what is the time scale 1 over gamma w, I am call it gamma w, so 1 over time, uh, because that's what I call the growth rate of the waves, okay? So this has dimensions of 1 over time. Growth rate. So remember also that this guy here, we said it before, we repeat it, is delta B square over B zero square. So what I want to do now is calculate gamma W. And this gamma W, uh, in order to do that, you have to equate this one to this one. So these two must be equal. So if the system reaches uh, some sort of a balance in which the rate of transfer of momentum due to diffusion is transferred to the waves, then the waves must grow at a rate which is gamma w. So from now on, this is just algebra. So let me write this uh, the final result here. It's just a, a little bit of uh, equations, but it's really simple. So gamma w that comes out is n larger than p divided by n gas vd minus va over va. So you understand where this rho gas came out because of alpha n speed. I wanted the alpha n speed down here, and that's v0 over square root of 4 pi rho. And uh, so the rho comes from there times omega cyclotron. So as a conclusion of the previous finding, namely that if you have a bunch of alpha n waves, particles scatter in that background of alpha n waves, if that happens, it must also happen that momentum is transferred to those waves, which are forced to grow in amplitude at a rate which is uh, given by this expression. Hmm. What is this expression? Okay, let's look at uh, some conditions. Say, imagine that you want to do this in the galaxy. Okay? In the galaxy, um, this uh, n at 1 GV is of the order of 10 to minus 9 particles per cubic centimeter. 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus 10, right? Uh, 10 to minus 9 particles per cc. This is one particle per cc. V drift in the galaxy, it's of the order of a couple of times, a few times the alpha n speed. So this is basically a term of order unity. An omega uh, cyclotron, uh, if I remember correctly, is uh, kilohertz, no? It's about kilohertz, uh, but I should check. But just put the numbers in here and you can easily check. But when you put the numbers in, this, the time scale corresponding to um, this phenomenon, and the time scale for the wave growth is gamma w to minus 1, 
is of the order of a thousand years. Now, a thousand years is ridiculously small compared with uh, the timescales that Pasquale will tell you in a second, in, in a few uh, minutes, related to escape from the galaxy, which is more like 100 million years. So it means that this is a very effective phenomenon that leads to wave growth. But what does it mean? If the waves grow, it means that particle diffusion becomes even more effective, right? So the idea is that, in principle, you can start from a level of perturbation that, perturbations that is very small, and through this phenomenon, you can actually amplify it to the levels that you need. Let's see what happens in another situation. For instance, close to a shock wave. Well, there the thing is much more extreme, right? Because omega cyclone is roughly the same, right? Because it only depends on B0, and B0 is roughly the galactic magnetic field, so micro gauss fields, okay? So omega cyclotron is roughly the same. But VD, remember I told you that uh, particles are uh, accelerated at the shock, right? And they are diffusing. But if you are sitting in the reference frame of the interstellar medium, you see the shock coming towards you. So in fact, in that frame, the particles are moving with a bulk speed, which is the shock velocity. So in this uh, example, VD is of the order of V shock, which, of course, is much, much larger than VD. It's about 10,000 times larger than VLVN, sorry. Much larger than VLVN. So for a shock wave, for the case of a shock wave, this guy, uh, N of P, is of the order of psi cosmic rays rho v shock squared divided by the mass of the proton, okay? And this is the usual density. So let's say that this is rho over mp, okay? This is of order v shock over v alvan. And omega cyclotron is the same as in the normal conditions. Okay, so you see that this guy goes away, and this is uh, psi cosmic rays times V shock over C uh, squared times V shock over V alvan and omega cyclotron. You can easily see that this term is extremely large, right? For instance, if you assume that psi cosmic rays is uh, um, of order 10%, so if this is 0.1. Uh, this one is of the order of 1 30th. 30, 30, 30th. So let's even exaggerate. Let's say it's at 10 to minus 2, so 1,000 kilometer per second. 1,000 or 3,000 kilometer per second. So that uh, ratio is fine. So this is of order 10 to minus 2. So squared is 10 to minus 4. But then you have 10,000 kilometer per second divided by uh, uh, order 10 kilometer per second at most. So you have uh, 1,000, so 10 to 3. And this is, uh, again, 10 to 3 Earths. So you see that this uh, object here is of the order of 10 to 2, 10, 10. Second to minus 1, <laughs> OK? So in matter of seconds, you generate additional alpha N waves, or you amplify the ones that were already sitting there. So the phenomenon is extremely important. It's not just a tiny, small correction that you can ignore. OK, <clears throat> so now in principle, you have uh, something that uh, uh, can explain why you increase the value of the amplitude of the waves. What does that mean in practice? Well, in practice, it means that you are decreasing f of k, right? You are increasing, sorry, f of k. You are increasing f of k. And since it is in the denominator of the diffusion coefficient, when you increase f of k, you are decreasing the diffusion coefficient. So this goes in the direction of making the diffusion coefficient smaller 
but by making the diffusion coefficient smaller, that means that the acceleration time is shorter, therefore the maximum energy can be higher. So this is the game that you're trying to play. So this phenomenon is absolutely crucial. In the essence of this phenomenon, then you are back to the problem down here in which the maximum energy is of the order of a GB. Now, when does this fail? Well, remember that uh, I told you many times this phenomenon of resonance assumes that you have a magnetic field B0 which is uh, ordered on a large scale and then you're making the particles uh, rotate around it, right? And the assumption behind all this uh, treatment that we have done is delta B is much smaller than B0. When delta B, by growing, becomes larger than B0, of course, you screw up the initial assumption because uh, there is no resonance that you can achieve anymore because the whole field is going berserk, right? Therefore, this phenomenon, by the very essence of it, in the sense that you built it in a way that you want the resonance to occur, okay, cannot uh, exceed delta B over B over the one. Now, I, we don't have time to go in that direction again, but uh, I tell you that even in the presence of this phenomenon, which is extremely effective, the maximum energy that you can get at a typical supernova is at most of the order of 10 to 4 GeV, 10 TeV. Okay? So of, after all this work, the Emax that you get from a typical supernova hardly exceeds uh, 10 to 4 GeV, which is, of course, much larger than GeV, but it cannot be the end of the story because we see particles in cosmic rays which are in the PV region, okay? So it means that nature is hiding something else. And I have 35 minutes to tell you what is this something else. It's going to uh, be a little bit... Uh, um, I can give you the notes of this, but at least I want to uh, describe the essence of it. Now, here we are going into the realm of stuff on which people are actually working right now, okay? So these are things that are research uh, stuff. And so it is okay to miss some details because, again, people are still figuring out themselves the details. But the basic essential ideas are relatively easy to explain. So let me try at least, okay? The um, idea is the following. So you're accelerating cosmic rays at a shock front, okay? So again, this is the shock, and uh, this C, upstream, downstream. And the particles are being diffusing uh, across the shock as we have done several times by now, right? But now, if you're looking at this phenomenon from far away, so if you're looking at, if you're sitting here, in other words, no, what you see is really a bunch of charged particles, positively charged particles, that are trying to come towards you. Okay? Um, a bunch of charged particles that are trying to come towards you is a current, right? So what happens to the plasma that is sitting here when it sees a current coming towards them? Well, this is a plasma. It has a high conductivity. It doesn't like to be charged. It doesn't like currents in it. So it's going to try to compensate for these things, right? So now you have upstream, upstream, you have a gas made of protons in the gas. I'm talking about gas, okay, the plasma, with a charge E. And then you have electrons with a charge minus E, right? And then you have now cosmic rays, which have a positive charge. Hmm? So in a sense, what we are saying is that the, the so in normal condition, this is equal to zero. But now we have that NP plus N uh, cosmic rays uh, 
minus any e equals zero. Right? Moreover, if I have a cosmic ray current, and the cosmic ray current is n cosmic rays times the velocity of the shock, what can I do to compensate it? Well, I must have the electrons and the ions are going to move with respect to each other so as to compensate that right, to compensate this current. So in a sense here, I have protons, which are 2,000 times uh, heavier than electrons. So in reality, what is going to move is the electrons, not the ions, right? So the electrons are going to move with some uh, V, let's call it V um, relative drift, so small d, okay, with respect to the, uh, with respect to the, to the ions. And you understand here that n cosmic rays is very small. V shock is very large. And here the opposite happens. This is large, and this can be small. So with a small velocity of drift between electrons and protons, you can easily compensate for the current of cosmic rays. But still, this means that you have a current in the glass, in the in the plasma, upstream, a small current, which is, however, exactly the same current as the cosmic rays. So you have a J cosmic rays in the plasma, which we will call a return current. So the current of the electrons, which is exactly the same as the current of the, in magnitude, the same as the current of cosmic rays, but in the opposite direction. So you have a minus J cosmic rays. But if you have a J cosmic rays and you have a magnetic field there, you have a force. So all of a sudden, something is happening to those famous uh, MHD equations that we wrote uh, a couple of days ago. And we went through the, all the calculations and the effort of calculating the perturbations. You remember? That's how we got Alvan waves and sonic waves, magnetosonic waves, blah, blah. No? So how does that um, system of thing change when I add this uh, small contribution? So let's just write the equation first. It's uh, usual, the rho in dt plus, plus the divergence of rho u equals zero. Then uh, rho du in dt equal to minus nabla p. And then you remember there was the four pi curl of b vector b term. And this is the new one. This is the return current, which is created in the plasma in order to compensate the cosmic ray current. And the rest are the same. So you have d and dt of uh, p rho to minus gamma equals 0. Uh, you have uh, dB in dt uh, equal curl of V vector B. These are exactly the same as before. Divergence of B equals zero. And let's even sit in the most comfortable, in the simplest example that we have done the other day, namely in which B zero is ordered ar uh, along the z-axis. And let's only consider modes with k parallel to b0. So you remember this was the easiest example. So what we did the other day was, as you might remember, to perturb these equations, right? So all the quantities, rho goes into rho plus delta rho. Uh, b becomes b0 plus delta b and so on and so forth. No? That's the way we got the alpha waves and so on. And the calculation was really simple. It's complicated and, you know, it's boring, but it's simple. It's just a bunch of vector products. So you can redo exactly the same exercise. There is no difference whatsoever. There is only one complication, but again, it's an arithmetic complication, uh, this term here. So you just keep that term. J cosmic rays, you assume that you know what it is. It doesn't enter the... 
the rest of the calculation. So there is only a term delta B that appears there. So it's exactly the same calculation, nothing different from what we did the other day. So in, in this sense, it's um, a bit weird that it took four years to do it. But OK, sometimes you just, well, anyway. So um, so let's see if I can uh, get some intermediate results that you can So, for instance, you get uh, out of this uh, exercise, <coughs> delta ux equal to k squared va squared over omega squared. You remember this is uh, very similar to what we did the other day. But there is this small correction here. Well, you might recognize from here that uh, if you ignore the term in J cosmic rays, those first two are exactly the alpha N waves, no? So clearly, it's, the exercise is really very, very uh, similar. It leads you to the same thing. The only interesting stuff that is happening here is that you're coupling now delta UX with delta UI, but this is a simple exercise to solve, right? You just cross, <clears throat> you just solve in a crossing way this thing. And you remember the game, the end the part of these games is always to find the dispersion relation. So you want some function f of k omega equal to zero. So after you go through this, because of, so if you did this exercise with only these two terms, of course you would find again of n waves. Now we find a slightly different um, equation, which is omega to the fourth plus k squared va squared squared minus 2 omega squared k squared va squared equal to alpha squared k squared, where this alpha I defined as j cosmic rays b0 over uh, rho c. So this is the dispersion relation of these additional uh, modes, OK? So if you redo this again in the standard situation, which means alpha equals zero, you get the standard modes. But when alpha is non-zero, there is something very interesting that pops out. And this is the interesting part. Um, notice, however, there is a very crucial news here. The other day, we found all this dispersion relation, and we never worried. Omega was always a number. Hmm? This is a fourth order equation, which admits a uh, potentially uh, complex value of omega. Okay? But you remember we wrote the perturbations uh, in this form, and these objects here are all exponential of minus i omega t plus i k dot x. So if omega is imaginary, it means that you, and it has the uh, positive sign, uh, then it is an exponential growth. That's an instability, right? So let's concentrate on the imaginary part of this. So let's find the, 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 the one that uh, has omega square uh, less than zero. No? Because that's the interesting one. So interestingly, it is possible to have omega square less than zero, provided k squared va squared is less than alpha times k, where alpha is this guy here. What does it in, in, entail in terms of uh, physics? Well, in terms of physics, it implies that k must be smaller than 4 pi over c j cosmic rays over b0. Let me call this k max. 
when k is smaller than this, and you notice that it is proportional to the, how many cosmic rays you have, okay, to the current of cosmic rays. So the larger the current of cosmic rays, the more effective is going to be the process. Well, if that happens, omega is equal uh, to k max VA. Now, interestingly, this mode that we just found, if you repeat the calculations, you will see it easily, it does not have any real part. These are purely growing modes. They are not propagating. These are modes that are excited in the plasma, and they don't move. They just grow. So they start from this, and it becomes wildly increasing. Now, this K-max, however, um, this K-max, however, is much larger than the Larmor radius of the particles. Now, remember what Pasquale told you and what we have seen yesterday, too. If the K is much larger than the resonant number, it looks something like this. No? And the Larmor radius is this. So you're supposed to average to zero. So clearly, these modes grow, grow like crazy, but they don't resonate with the cosmic rays. However, something really interesting happens. These modes growing means that you have a force on the plasma. And the force, again, is J cosmic rays vector B. And it goes in which direction? J uh, delta B. Okay goes in which direction? It goes in the direction which is perpendicular to B0. OK? So these uh, loops of magnet, you can Im Im uh, imagine this uh, delta Bx and delta By oscillating as a loop of magnetic field. And the force that we are talking about is a force that tries to take this loop and stretch it. So basically, while the instability is growing like crazy, the loops of field that you are creating are being stretched on larger scales. When does the whole thing stop? When the size of this thing is basically of the same order, it's the same as the Larmor radius of the particles in that field. Now, I realize I'm going a little fast here, but uh, there is no other time. I don't have other time, so I have to get there. So when the Larmor radius of the particles in the field that is growing exponentially is the same as the size of these loops, the instability stops. And uh, I've written down this in the, in the notes, but, when, but, but this happens basically when uh, you reach the condition that the uh, energy density in the form of uh, the current is the same as the energy density in the form of the particles uh, of the magnetic field that you are amplifying. Where is it? Just one second. Eh? I pulled out too many things. Oh. So, for instance, in the case of, um, of cosmic rays at a shock, that we have uh, considered so far, the conditions that uh, where the saturation is reached and the instability stops is a place where psi cosmic rays over rho, uh, rho V shock squared divided by logarithm of P max over P min times V shock over C is the same as delta B, B squared over 4 pi. So basically, the field saturates at the same level as the energy density of the particles that you're accelerating. Now, in this, uh, if you put the numbers in this expression, you will get now values of milligauss for the magnetic field. Milligauss means about a 1,000 times larger than the magnetic field in the galaxy. On a scale, which is basically the diffusion length of the particles. Hmm? This field is produced here, upstream, 
not here. This field is produced where particles only can diffuse. There is nothing else that can reach that region upstream but the accelerated particles. Do we see these fields? Hmm. About in 2004, some observations in the X-rays started popping out, and they were very puzzling, because they uh, started seeing, uh, I don't have this, well, maybe I can connect the computer for a second, right, while I talk. Um, but there is a, um, a bunch of observations of uh, so-called X-ray rims. What are these X-ray rims? People looked in uh, X-rays and uh, saw non-thermal uh, emission in the X-rays with a strange morphology. It was very, very focused uh, along, uh, around uh, the shock surface. Yeah, I have to find it first, right? Yeah. Lezioni, chi sei tu, San Paolo? Yeah. It's uh, interesting to see the comparison of the expected scheme of the lectures and where we are. Um, Okay, so for instance, this, this picture here, just uh, focus on uh, the top right one, this one, okay? So you see that uh, very tenuous bluish line all around the shock, uh, uh, all around Tycho. You see that it's even a little bit detached from the rest. So. That is X-ray emission. It's purely non-thermal. The spectrum is a power law-ish kind of thing. Uh, and the thickness that it has is uh, of the order of 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3 parsec. So it's extremely narrow rim. The only way that you can produce that X-ray emission is by synchrotron of uh, high-energy electrons. To do that, you need uh, about 10 TeV electrons. And the thickness of the shock, the, sorry, the thickness of the emission is of the order of how far an electron can reach in one lost time, right? So it's of the order of d tau loss. Comparing this guy here with the observation, you can infer an estimate of the magnetic field present in that region, and it's milligauss. So the magnetic field in these rims, and those rims are basically observed now in all young supernova remnants. Kepler, uh, Tycho, Supernova 1006, all of them have the same feature of, uh, in some cases, more regular, in other cases, less regular, but in all these cases, you have evidence for very strong magnetic fields uh, in, the na in, in narrow rims, roughly corresponding to the location of the shock uh, of the remnant. Uh, so we have indirect evidence that the magnetic field is strongly amplified because the field in the surrounding region is only microgauss. So something has happened in that little layer there so that the field from a microgauss has been pushed up by three orders of magnitude. And the most plausible explanation is that really are the accelerated particles themselves that are going there, that are doing this job. Now, this uh, uh, idea is having a lot of attention, or is attracting a lot of attention. And of course, it's instrumental if you want to reach the knee. You can repeat the usual exercise of calculating the maximum energy in these fields. And uh, even with uh, this very strong, very effective process of amplification, you get close to the knee, but you have to uh, 
in, you have to ask for a specific cl class of sources where you can get to PEV. Uh, specific class of sources, I mean, uh, for instance, a very energetic supernovae that explode in the wind of the pre-supernova, the kind of stuff that uh, uh, Murase was uh, talking about. Okay? So it's not like all supernovae can reach the knee. It's only some uh, supernova remnants that can actually reach extremely high uh, values of the energy. So I hope that the main message that I wanted to convey, and I hope that it passed through in, the, in these classes, in these lectures, is that there is a tight connection between the microphysics of a bunch of charged particles moving in a plasma and what we observe in the form of cosmic rays on uh, large scales. The issues of maximum energy of the spectra and so on are all connected somehow to phenomena that are taking place, place on very small uh, scales. That's why it, it's so hard to solve these problems because you know, we are talking about the knee for 30 years. We're talking about the origin of cosmic rays now for 100 years. But it is extremely difficult because of this connection with the microphysics and, of course, also the fact that these are charged particles, so they never come from the place where they have been produced. So diffusion in between scrambles around the directions of arrival to the point that it's hard to, uh, it's hard to see where they are coming from. Uh, we concentrated in these lectures on the galactic part of the acceleration. And of course, there is much more than this. For instance, the sources that Kota Murase have, uh, has discussed are like gamma ray bursts and so on. They are a completely different kind of beast. And many of the assumptions uh, that we used in finding shock acceleration, for instance, diffusive shock acceleration at uh, Newtonian shocks, non-relativistic shocks, fail when you apply them to relativistic shocks. One uh, uh, easy thing that you may understand is that if the shock moves at the speed of light, then the velocity of the shock and the velocity of the particles is basically the same. So even without knowing all the details, you may easily understand two things. First, that the assumption that the particle distribution is roughly isotropic at the shock cannot be fulfilled because they go the same speed. And second, it must be harder for the particles to go back to the shock once they cross it because they go at the same speed of the shock, right? And in fact, uh, a very simple argument that you, can, uh, that you can make, if I can have another two, three minutes, is, uh, is it, why do you stop me? It's 10 minutes away from me. Because it takes only five more minutes. To OK. <laughs> Okay, so uh, for instance, an easy thing that you can see in the case of relativistic shocks is um, the following. Assume you have a shock wave and uh, upstream, the magnetic field is almost parallel to the shock. Well, if it is almost parallel to the shock, even behind the shock after Lorentz compression, the field is roughly parallel. But how good is this assumption? Well, this angle must be smaller than 1 over the Lorentz vector of the shock. But this condition is really very, very tough. For a gamma ray burst, Lorentz factor is 300. So it means that un unless you are absolutely parallel, something is going to happen. What happens? Well, if the field is more inclined upstream than 1 over gamma, then once you boost it on the other side, it's going to be perpendicular. So the field, even a field like this, downstream will look like this. And this is what we call a perpendicular shock. When the shock is parallel to the shock front, it's called perpendicular, okay? But now, another thing that you can grasp is that when you write the rankine gonier relations at a, at a strong shock in the limit in which the Lorentz factor is very large, hmm, what happens is that U2 asymptotically tends to one third of the speed of light. Okay? So, what does that mean? That if you are sitting in the downstream now, if you are sitting in the downstream now, the shock is moving away from you at one third of the speed of light. Hmm? So, imagine that, imagine that you have the shock at this, let me do it bigger. Imagine that you have the shock at, uh, at this location when a particle goes 
and cross the shock. And uh, you want the Fermi acceleration to occur. So you want the particle to go back to the shock, right? So the, the particle is doing this, uh, the usual gyration, no? And at the same time, the shock is moving. So how long does it take for the particle to reach a place where, at least in principle, can cross the shock again? It's about half or three-fourths of, right, of a rotation, right? So a Larmor gyration is RL, and the time that it takes is RL over the, is 2 pi RL over C, right? If uh, the rotation is full. Otherwise, it's 3 fourths of this. No? This is the time necessary to do 3 fourths of a gyration. In the same time, the shock is moving. And it's moving at one third of the speed of light. So how far did it go? One third of C times RL over C, 2 pi, 3 fourths. This goes away. Uh, this goes away. And this becomes pi over 2 times RL. And this is larger than RL. So if the particle crosses the shock, it will not make it back. So it is very difficult at relativistic shock to make the particle go back to the shock front. In other words, it's like the return probability is smaller than in the, uh, the non-relativistic case. And typically, this results in steep spectra. So in order to have the same kind of physics at a relativistic shock, you need, for instance, very strong turbulence that makes the particle go back before even one gyration. But if that happens, other implications are there for the maximum energy. So it, it's sort of a people are debating a lot in research terms on the importance of these relativistic shocks for particle acceleration. That's one of the reasons why there is an increased attention for alternative ideas like reconnection in relativistic plasmas and so on. But just, this just gives you a flavor of uh, the dynamicity of the research environment in this field. There is a lot to do. There is a lot of ideas going uh, around, and also there are a lot of observations that you can compare your theories with. So it's a good time to work in, in, uh, in this field. In the last uh, 30 seconds, I wanted just to do a little bit of advertisement. Uh, the place where I am is the Gran Sasso Science Institute. It's a, research, it's a center for advanced studies in Italy. Uh, we have a program of PhD uh, students, uh, which is about uh, uh, in four different areas. One is physics, mathematics, computer science, and uh, uh, social sciences. And uh, we hire 40 students a year. They are paid a salary, food, lodging, everything. So it's a pretty good life. Um, so if you hear of some of your friends that might be interested in starting a program with us, please uh, solicit them to apply for a PhD position there. Usually we do interviews. We get, uh, for 10 positions in physics, typically we get three, 400 applications. So it's very competitive. About half of our students are outside of Italy. So it's a pretty international environment. Deadline was yesterday, so this is, no, no, yesterday meaning that it just expired, so, but for the next year it would be a good, um, a good deal. Unfortunately, you, you, you know, I had to come now for the school, right, so, okay, so thank you for your attention and please come uh, ask questions and uh, also after the lectures if you think of something that you are curious about, uh, write an email, I'll be happy to respond. Thank you. I guess what Pasquale meant about the next cycle is still what I was saying in the beginning. There, he is here, Pasquale Serpico is here, I am here, Carlos. So use this context in case you want to build something on a project or a PhD programs in the future anytime. And especially if you have one more year to prepare the application or tell your friends, there is enough time to 
compete in a competitive process, no? And by the way, of course, we have a program of postdocs as well, so you are welcome to apply for those, too. Questions for Pasquale? Oh. Hi. Um, when and how the reverse shock is formed? And how does it affect all that we are we're talking about? Yeah, I had a sixth lecture ready for you, but uh, no, I mean, I, I had planned to put this in the course, but I didn't have time to cover that. So the idea is that when a supernova explodes or any explosion occurs, in fact, all this mathematics was developed for a nuclear explosion, not for astrophysics, and later was applied in astrophysics. But the, the idea is when you have an explosion, you have a first stage of so-called ejecta-dominated. Ejecta-dominated meaning, um, meaning that you have a certain mass M of ejecta that are leaving, that they are trying to expand, M that is trying to expand, and if E is the energy of the explosion, then you know that E is equal to mv squared, so you generate a shock wave which moves at a velocity V shock. For the parameters of a supernova, this is 10 to 51 ergs, and this guy comes out typically 10,000 kilometers per second or so, okay? Now, what happens is that you have a shock front that is moving out, but then there are the ejecta that are pushing from down here. So the shock that people usually call the shock is the forward shock. So it's the shock moving into the interstellar medium, okay? But at the same time, the information about the explosion is propagating into the ejecta as well. This is called the reverse shock. And then there is in between something that is called a contact discontinuity, which is the separation between the shocked interstellar medium and the shocked ejecta. During this phase, the velocity of the shock remains almost constant, not exactly, but changes only a little, okay? Because the mass that you're accumulating here from the interstellar medium is small. At some point, however, the mass accumulated, which is rho u, the flux of mass, it's again conservation of mass, we wrote it somewhere. So it's rho u times four pi r shock squared t, this is the mass accumulated in that time, becomes equal to the mass of the ejecta. This, when this happens, you enter a new phase of the explosion, which is called the set of Taylor phase. At this time, the reverse shock uh, reach the center, so goes to implode onto the center of the explosion, okay? So from that moment on, you don't have much of a reverse shock, unless there may be phenomena like bouncing and, you know, uh, more complex uh, ideas. But at the zero order, this is what, uh, what happens. So the reverse shock is propagating into the ejecta of the supernova, which is usually a place where very low magnetic fields and very small densities are achieved at the later times. But there are situations like Casse in which there uh, is radio emission, for instance, coming from the reverse, from where we think that the reverse shock is. Hi, uh, I have two pairs of questions. Two pairs, <laughs> so <laughs> four. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> Yes, but it come, uh, they come coupled. Into, well, okay. Um, I missed uh, two parts. Uh, That's good. First, <laughs> uh, two. when you say that the, the interesting case was the frequency squared less than zero, mm -hmm. I didn't understand why. And related to that, um, why, if it has to be omega squared less than zero, then it is K max times VA. Okay, so um, the reason why omega square, I'm focusing on omega squared less than zero is because I want to find the modes that are unstable. 
you can do okay. the whole thing, of course. But for brevity, I mean, I didn't have much time, so I focused only on the interesting modes. Okay. Interesting modes, in the, uh, omega squared less than zero means that omega is imaginary, mm. right? Yes. So if omega is imaginary, again, um, I always erase, well, uh, here. If omega is imaginary, then I can have either a damping mode or a growing mode depending on the sign. Uh -huh. So that's the reason why omega squared less than zero. That's why I focused on those modes. It doesn't mean that they are the only modes. It just means that those are the modes that I focused for this analysis. Okay. The second part uh, is really the result of the calculation. So it, it's, uh, um, it's not, that is not the dependence on K. That, that is the largest value of the frequency of the unstable modes. So it's the ones that grow the fastest. <laughs> But of course, there is a dependence on K as well. In fact, when you plot the imaginary part, so you want to do this, right? You want to write imaginary part and real part of the frequency. And uh, what you see if you do it properly, which is not the way we did it, is something like this. This is the imaginary part, and this is K max. And uh, for the real part, is something like this. So the real part goes basically to zero. Imaginary part goes up. The way that you should do this is the way that I told you in the second lecture, through the Vlasov equation. Mm -hmm. So this was a sort of a simpler way of getting there. The correct way of getting there would be through kinetics. So you write again, usual thing, Vlasov equation for protons, Vlasov equation for the electrons, Vlasov equation for the accelerated particles, Maxwell equations, put everything together, perturb, and, uh, uh, and you study the unstable modes. Okay? Okay. We got it through a little bit of a shortcut. Okay. And then I... Uh, <laughs> I, I go with the second pair. pair. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, with that part of the, the expanding uh, line fields of the of the magnetic field, and uh, I missed uh, why they expand. And the second question associated to it is, if one can interpret it, interpret it like the path of the of the cosmic rays swept out the magnetic field, or is or that is another uh, phenomenon? Yeah, so basically, because of the fact that uh, uh, instability grows on very small scales, so you are way off resonance, right? So the current that is propagating to zero order is not perturbed by those modes, because you cannot resonate. But the field keeps growing. At the same time, imagine of being an element of plasma in that place. So uh, you can write rho du in dt, which is the force exerted on that element of plasma, equal j, cosmic rays, delta b over c, which is the Lorentz force, right? So this guy is displaced, right, because of the action of this force. So if you write delta b in the form of a delta B original, uh, say delta B tilde, exponential of gamma T, where gamma is the uh, growth rate. So gamma is uh, the imaginary part of the frequency, okay? And let's assume for a second that rho doesn't change too much uh, with uh, space, with time, sorry. So you can approximate this as uh, uh, a rho, so you integrate this, is rho, delta u of the order of 1 over c, j, cosmic rays, delta b, 1 over gamma, delta b. And then you want to calculate the additional integral, okay, the one that leads to x. So rho delta x is 1 over c, j, cosmic rays, delta b. Uh, I had already written delta b here, sorry. So 1 over c, j, cosmic rays, delta b, 1 over gamma, square. There is another gamma that's pulled down. I take rho here, okay? 
So this is the, the, the displacement in the plasma, okay, in a time one over gamma. If this becomes of the same order of magnitude as the Larmor radius of the particles in the field delta B, then you start having the resonance because the particle and the wave have the same spatial extension. And at that point, you destroy the current. So you have the saturation of the instability. So the saturation corresponds to the condition that uh, J cosmic rays delta B over uh, rho C gamma squared equal E uh, Larmor radius. So E over E delta B, okay? So you see already from here what is going on, where this gamma again is the imaginary part of the frequency. So it's KV max, K max v, uh, VA, sorry, K max VA. Delta B you take it on the other side, so delta B square is the energy density. Delta B square is the energy density, and this gamma through the current knows about how many cosmic rays there are. So from here you derive the conditions, the condition that the magnetic field that saturation as an energy density delta B square over eight pi that is roughly the energy density in cosmic rays at the shock times V shock over C. But the idea is that you have this displacement and when the displacement becomes of the same order as the Larmor radius in that amplified field, the current gets destroyed. Hi. Um, concerning that uh, tiny shell uh, of electron emitting synchrotron, um, you, you say that the, the distribution of the electrons is non-thermal, but in the, in the derivation of that return current, you use that the... No, no, the, these are the electrons in the plasma. Yes, but you use that the cosmic ray current was uh, of positive, positive. charge. Uh, you're right, you're right. But the electrons are about one hundredth or one thousandth uh, uh, of the protons. So it's a good approximation. Okay. The okay. number density of electrons in the cosmic ray at the shock is much smaller than the number density of the protons. Okay. That's why. Thank you. And, oh, sorry, a, a curiosity <laughs> about that uh, gamma, mm -hmm. gamma ray uh, yeah. picture. <laughs> Uh, why is uh, like elongated. M moved elongated. with respect? Yeah, those are veritas observations. That in part, it's the, the res resolution, which doesn't allow to select very uh -huh. well. The, the other thing is that there might be a, uh, over density of gas in that region. In that yeah. region? Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. So we have just accounted for cosmic ray pressure. Should us at any point consider radiation pressure also? Uh, you mean from the supernova itself or from the, from the particles radiation? From the particles radiation. Yeah, but that is a terribly small amount, right? And moreover, the, that is a very small amount in terms of uh, energy density, but not only that, but it's, uh, you need to couple that radiation to the gas. So there is an addition, so the radiation is little to start with. And then the interaction of the radiation with the plasma itself, it's even smaller. So in the end, that is a very small effect. Uh, the only place where radiation plays a role, but not the radiation produced by the particles, is at the very end of the supernova explosion, uh, supernova evolution. I told you that you go through the set of Taylor phase. But then when the shock velocity drops with time, and it drops, of course, because um, here. It drops because at some point, I told you that E is equal to mv shock squared. But at some point, when the mass accumulator is large enough, then, in fact, the E becomes equal to 1 half of m plus 4 pi r shock squared rho u 
T V squared, right? Because you are accumulating mass in time. So of course the velocity is going to drop with time because you're accumulated more and more. And at some point, the velocity of the shock drops around 400 kilometers per second. And at that point, the density at the, behind the shock is sufficient to start radiating the energy away. So what you have is uh, the so-called radiative phase of the supernova, which means that, the, that that's the end of the story. So the, evolution, the supernova remnant dies when you reach that stage. But it's the radiation produced by atoms and molecules behind the shock, not the ones of accelerated particles. Pasquale, before we saw the um, omega is k max VA, we saw the uh, perturbations in the velocity distribution. I'm just wondering experimentally, is it possible to observe these parameters or do we have to infer them? And what are the challenges in actually tracking the velocity distribution with regards to the shock and also to the cosmic rays? Well, you mean that uh, the dispersion relation you saw was written in terms of the velocity? It was, yeah, it was written here before, but it's erased now. Uh, yeah, so you can decide with respect to what you want to do the dispersion relation, right? You could have done it in terms of delta B or in any other function, in any other quantity. It's just a perturbation analysis, right? So your question is if you can observationally access the fluctuation in velocity. For example, because we have, you know, gas in the way or something that may obscure us, is it, is it actually an experimental observable that we, we measure? Or what do we... What, what does an experiment look for in terms I, of... I don't think you can see those. They are on two small scales. Yeah. They are on two small scales. I don't think you can see the fluctuation velocity. You see the magnetic field yeah. only because the electrons are radiating in it. Otherwise, you wouldn't see that either. Sure. Yeah, so in velocity, I don't think you can access that information. Okay. Moreover, again, as I said, these are basically purely growing modes. So the velocity that we're talking about is all in the perpendicular plane. It's the X and Y, yeah. yeah. Any more questions? I think it's a good moment to thank Pasquale again for this and all the previous classes. Thank you. There will be more time in the afternoon. Thanks for bearing with me for all this. <laughs> thank you very much, Pasquale. Yeah. Thank you.